Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. This, of course, is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing, amongst other things, the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Andor and this is what's coming up on the show today. Well, Zimbabwe marks 41 years of independence today and we speak to two seasoned journalists uh, about uh, the state of the media in the country. And a little later, intimacy coordination is a new and growing role in uh, film and television sets. New protocols have uh, been launched to help protect actors doing intimate scenes on screen. And uh, we'll be finding out what those look like. And our regular features, of course, include uh, the Back in News history. And uh, we take you back to the year 1996, when the ANC senior MPs announced uh, his, uh, at senior MP announced his resignation. Find out who and why. Uh, so that's the show. But remember, you can emerge, engage with us on social media using uh, the Twitter handle, hashtag SABC Media Monitor. And you can also share your views with us via WhatsApp. And this is the number to use, 065-862-4548. That number again, 065-862-4548. So, before we uh, get into those highlighted stories on the program, let's first take a look at uh, what's on the front pages of the Sunday newspapers this morning. And we start with the Sunday Times. And uh, the Sunday Times is uh, really looking at uh, Ace Mahashule, who seems to be an embattled Samson. And that's the uh, uh, headline that they're using. And what they're referring to is that some people are accusing him of uh, wanting to pull down the pillars of the ANC on all of us. You'll remember the biblical story, Samson, he uh, went blind and uh, he they cut his hair, but when he got his strength back, he pushed the pillars of the palace and it crumbled. And so they're suggesting that uh, Ace Mahashule is doing the same to the ANC. So that's the front page of the Sunday Times. But let's take a look at the Sunday Independent. Well, that's leading with the ESCOM 15% electricity tariff increase, describing it as unjustifiable and that it will cause untold hardship on millions of unemployed and poor South Africans who may be forced to resort to cheaper but unsafe sources of energy such as paraffin and coal. The paper is reporting that uh, uh, around 160 billion rand each was spent on the uh, power stations Medupe and Kusile when initial quotes were only around 34 billion. The uh, Sunday Tribune, uh, that has a US police shooting on its front page. Not unusual, but this time though, the person killed by police is a South African. A former Durban rugby player, Lindan Mieni, was shot and killed on Wednesday night in the US state of Hawaii. Vieni was uh, living there uh, on this island state with his American wife and two young children. The uh, Weekend Argus on Sunday, well, the front page story there says that unions, uh, business organizations and political parties have slammed FMB Bank's uh, decision to shut down the accounts of uh, uh, IO Technologies, causing, uh, uh, saying that the country's big four banks are being players in the country's factional politics rather than protecting jobs. And the Sunday world, well that's leading with the ANC factional battles, saying that the party's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, is targeting RET faction sympathizers in the ANC committees. This, as uh, the paper says, ANC Secretary General Ace Mahashule's camp is disintegrating. The paper reports that uh, Ramaphosa is going for broke as he plans uh, to throw Makashule supporters out of the ANC National Disciplinary Committee. Well, that's uh, something certainly we'll be watching during the course of the week. Welcome back, you're still watching Media Monitor. Now, Zimbabwe marks 41 years as an independent nation from colonial rule today, a country that's enjoyed both success and challenge over the decades. So one relationship that has been tested over time is that of the authorities and the media. 
International NGO Reporters Without Borders uh, in its uh, 2020 Press uh, Freedom Index uh, ranked Zimbabwe 126 out of 180 countries measuring the level of freedom available to journalists. The report says that despite the change in leadership, the security apparatus has not let, yet let lost the habit of harassing journalists and uh, acts of intimidation, verbal attacks and confiscation of equipment are all still standard practice. So what's the state of play at this time? Have things improved for journalists in Zimbabwe? To find out, I spoke to two seasoned journalists, Hopol Chinono, an award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker, as well as Tichawana Zindoga, also a journalist, uh, head of content at uh, a publication called Review and Mail. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, today is Zimbabwe's Independence Day, 41 years later, and it's been a difficult relationship, particularly for the media, and uh, not just in recent times, but I think historically. And so maybe we can start with the present day. And uh, a question for both of you. How do you see the state of journalism in Zimbabwe 40 years on? Perhaps let me start with you, Hopewell. I think it's in a very terrible state of mind. And it's not surprising because journalism is not an island. Um, it's a reflection of what's happening in society. The economy is dead, which means that um, the media institutions, particularly the private press, is not able to pay journalists uh, competitive salaries. And because of that, they become compromised. And uh, we've seen a lot of repression, a lot of arrests and intimidation against journalists and something that was unheard of um, as of, uh, I mean, between, the, between 1980 and 1990. Um, but as the economy started getting uh, in a terrible state, you started seeing the repression, and not just repression of citizens, but uh, the, the, the intimidation of journalists started escalating. And I think at the moment, it's, it's worse than it has ever been. Uh, Titch, what about you? How do you see the state of play in Zimbabwe in terms of journalism? Yeah, um, I think my colleague did well to highlight um, some of the um, some of the topical issues um, that are be definitely the uh, media, uh, the state of media currently. But I would like to take a more uh, a, a more lo uh, longer view about the development of the media uh, within the past 40 years. I think you could um, uh, you could uh, uh, look at it from three perspectives. Uh, the development of the media, we have the, um, the early stages um, between 1980 and 1990, uh, and then uh, 2000s to uh, the, right up to 2020s uh, under this new, uh, new dispensation. So what we have seen uh, characteristic of these uh, uh, of these areas or of these phases is that uh, uh, we have seen stunted growth in media. Uh, Zimbabwe has poorly developed media ecologies uh, in the sense that uh, the state has dominated media um, and the state media uh, has become the biggest employer, the most profitable employer. And uh, you see what that comes with. It comes with a lot of censorship. It comes with a lot of propaganda. It comes with a lot of um, challenges regarding access, freedom of expression, and the enjoyment really uh, of um, uh, citizens' access um, uh, to information. So you see that in the early um, in the early independence to the two thousand uh, phase, uh, we, uh, we we generally had. Um, uh, one state broadcaster, one state agency that was uh, Ziana, uh, and the main uh, newspaper stable that is the uh, Zim papers, they dominated the space. After 2000s, there came in some competition uh, and 
it was then that we needed a greater competition and greater access in terms of citizens uh, having a plural voices, diverse voices, but it was suppressed. And the voices within the media themselves were also harshly suppressed and there came a lot of laws, um, very nasty. You talk, of the, you talk of the likes of IPA, the likes of um, um, Broadcasting um, Services Act and so forth. Uh, these are now being progressively relaxed or repealed uh, as, the, uh, as the authorities now want us to believe. But you will see that as they they claim to open up the media space, um, the world has moved on. People no longer rely on, on the state broadcaster, on state newspapers and so forth. There are just so many voices, so many avenues that people can uh, get their uh, information from. Uh, and now we see that they are licensing more players, which players really are not new uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, they are coming from different universes in terms of the political economy. Uh, they are more of the same. Be that as it may, you see that uh, they are opening uh, new radio stations, new television stations, when nobody really uh, takes time to watch TV okay. uh, watch, uh, or along, listen to the radio. I'm going to along a little bit just because of time, but um, I, hope, mm. well, I know that you've been through quite a lot uh, in recent months and uh, recent years, but perhaps we were given clues Long back, when we think about veteran journalists like Wolf Mbanga being forced to exile, journalists like uh, Mark Chabunduka, um, it seems as if this has always been a recipe uh, of the authorities. All right. Um, the signs have always been there. If you remember in 1998, 1999, Mark Chabunduka and Rachel were incarcerated for reporting that the military was involved in some uh, heinous acts. And um, as, as my colleague uh, Teach rightly said, um, we are living in a, in, a, in, a, in a time where the old systems of media, the newspapers, uh, the radio stations, and the, and the uh, television stations are becoming irrelevant. And the repression has become more accentuated simply because there are many voices that Teach uh, made reference to. People like myself, people like Teach, who's running uh, a, a very good newspaper, uh, the Mail Review. And because of that, the state has become more angrier, it has become more repressive. That's why people like me are being thrown into prison because in 1990 or in 1999, I could not have had the access and space to do what I do today, to report and hold the powerful to account, to tell the citizens that your money uh, uh, is being looted, to tell the citizens that the natural resources of the country are being looted. In 1999, we would have known about it, but we didn't have platforms to express how we felt and to tell the citizens about what was happening around them so that they make conscious uh, decisions when interfacing with public life. But because of social media, uh, places like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we uh, are able now to communicate with each other in a way that we've never been able to, to do so maybe 20 years ago. And um, if you look at Zimbabwe, it is the only country which is not at war in Africa that has only one TV station. And yet in 1960, Zimbabwe and Nigeria were the only two countries that had television in sub-Saharan Africa. So we've lagged behind. And if you look at a country like um, South Africa, they only had television in 1976. Right now, South Africa has got over 40 uh, TV stations across the, bro across the spectrum. And because of that, our, our state uh, of the media was so controlled by the state because they controlled almost all the radio stations, even the ones that are supposedly private. They are owned by members of parliament for ZANU-PF. And um, recently, as Teach alluded to, they gave licenses for TV stations, six licenses. One went to um, a wife of a government minister, another went to the military, another went to a newspaper group that is very aligned to a faction in the ruling ZANU-PF. So there's actually no space for independent media, but it has come through uh, social media, 
And because of that, they've become more repressive. They want to, they're actually in the process of enacting a law called the Patriot Act, which stops us as journalists and stops citizens from criticizing not only the government and its actions, but from criticizing the president, because they, they are saying that if you criticize the president, you are criticizing the man who's going to go out there and look for investment, so you're hurting the country. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, Patriot Bill just now again, but um, Tishan, I want to ask you um, what some of the challenges were for you working for state media. You ended up being acting editor of the Herald, which is the biggest national newspaper daily. Um, what kind of pressures does one face working inside an institution such as that? Oh, yeah. Um you see that uh, it's almost a straight jacket uh, working within an institution like this. You know that you are conditioned. And when you get in there, you know what you're supposed to do uh, within, the, um, within the apparatus of, um, uh, of the government. Uh, by the way, um, we, refer this to, uh, we refer to this media establishment as state media. So um, having uh, knowledge that this is state media, as an editor or as a journalist working there, you know that part of uh, or the majority of your job is to support uh, the government of the day. And uh, you might not do it. Uh, which, uh, I know a lot of colleagues who, um, who were close uh, supporters of the opposition, quite a majority of them within the establishment, but they would write uh, stories that would all the same please the government because they want to feed themselves and their families. As editors too, we know that uh, there are certain things that we might not agree with, but uh, have little choice in, in terms of um, uh, determination as to whether that goes in or out. Uh, sometimes you see that your job depends on uh, putting the president. For example, on page one, uh, putting the first lady. Now we have a very attention-seeking first lady of the republic, um, uh, Auxilia Bunangagwa. She demands space in that newspaper, and she makes hell out of somebody, uh, whether at the broadcasting side or in the newspaper side, that she does not... Um, uh, accord the space. You, know, you see, I remember that during my time as acting editor uh, that you know I would put uh, uh, I would put her stories possibly on page seven, which she possibly deserved if anything at all. Uh, but I was dragged over what calls for that, you know, and we then made a determination that no, she would be on page two. Uh, or possibly page one, you know, uh, and if, if you look at it right now, uh, it's, it's almost a template uh, that she is uh, on page two and she, her stories are not even combined, you know. Uh, she might do certain events on, on a single day, but she would insist through her, uh, through her PAs, uh, through her lackeys, uh, and, and within our media, uh, she will insist that these stories need to, to be separate uh, and these stories need to carry uh, um, certain pictures that she chooses. Uh, you, you do not even have the latitude to choose the picture of the first lady because her people, uh, will, will, her people actually choose those pictures for you. And I understand that even the journalist that she takes on her tours they have to first send the copy to her before they send to us as editor. And uh, the, during my time, they exerted a lot of pressure, you know, on us that am I, that is the mother, they wanted to call her the mother of the nation, uh, am I once this and that and this story treated this way and picture. You know, it's very uncomfortable. It's very, uh, it's it's very bad, uh, it's, and it's very traumatic uh, for for editors, you know. Uh, and you see that um, I've I've uh, come clean on this uh, to say that 
to to report some of the things that I faced uh, at her hands, you know, being dragged over the hot calls that I alluded to because of the editorial decisions that I would have done. I mean, we know that this is a propaganda machine. We know that, you know, uh, people need to know uh, what the First Lady of the Republic da uh, does sometimes. But at the same time, your conscience and, and also the professional uh, handling, um, you know, would tell you that, you know, we cannot have three stories, or, you know, of the same person. Um, of the same person in in one edition, why don't we compact the coverage? But you know, um, it, it's something that would make make life difficult. And in particular, you see, this is something uh, that even previous editors had not faced. You know, the um, the challenges that that uh, that have come uh, with the new dispensation, especially regarding uh, the subject in end. All right, we, we're running out of time, sadly, but perhaps uh, we can use the Patriot Bill to assess uh, what might be coming in the future. And uh, maybe in closing, um, Hopal, let's start with you. Um, is democracy under threat if the attacks on journalists continue in this way? And you've mentioned the Patriot Bill. That's just one instrument, but we're seeing that journalists are getting jailed and arrested and harassed. So that's just part of the story. Is democracy under threat uh, with these attacks on the fourth estate? Well, democracy in Zimbabwe is, is, is literally non-existent at the moment because Mnangagwa has managed to manipulate both the judiciary and, and, and the legal systems to make sure that uh, all the members of parliament, almost all of them, that were elected under the opposition tag have been removed from parliament. And obviously it's, it, it has become a, a joke for anyone to say that Zimbabwe is, is a democracy um, with the abuse of the state institutions to go after journalists as has happened to me, people like um, Dudis Matutu being uh, driven underground. Um, obviously the idea is to instill the fear of God in not only ourselves, but in young journalists to say that if you report in this way, this is how we're going to deal with you. Imagine if we can do this to these senior journalists, what more of you? So no country thrives without a strong um, media. No country thrives without a, a strong 40 state. And in my case, I have been uh, jailed three times in the past uh, six months. I was charged under a law that does not exist. And I spent 21 days in prison. Now, how do you operate as a journalist when you're living in a country that can pick you up, the, the police can pick you up from your home um, and accuse you of something that you haven't done and charge you under a law that doesn't exist? It becomes so difficult for the average journalist to go out there and do their work. And because of that, a lot of journalists that I know of, especially the young ones, they've come up to me and say, I've come across this story, but I'm afraid of reporting it because most of these young journalists are freelance. They don't have a, a, a network which will back them up if they are arrested. They do not have um, regular salaries. So if they are arrested, it means that their families will starve. As, as my colleague teach um, correctly, uh, is the journalists, even in the state media empire, they don't necessarily believe in what they're writing, but because we live in a society where there are no jobs, 95% of the potential job workforce in Zimbabwe is at home, only 5% is at work. So these guys, they look at it and they say, if I go against the grain, I'll lose my job and I'll sit at home. All right, and uh, Tish, perhaps uh, your final word, I guess you must have sympathy for a lot of the colleagues that you've left behind, um, that they work under difficult circumstances. All they want to do is their job, but uh, it looks like politics perhaps still controls uh, their voices. Um, indeed. Um, I think what, um, what my colleague Hoppo has pointed out uh, regarding the Patriot Bill is, uh, uh, is correct. You know, um, somebody say, said uh, uh, it's, uh, patriot, uh, patriotism is the refuge of uh, rogues. You know, uh, there is an increase in roguery. 
um, around the pres- around the leadership, uh, the present leadership, uh, which stems from uh, the crisis of expectations. Uh, when the uh, when the administration came in as a new um, uh, as a new ex in town. Um, it had a lot of expectations uh, on its uh, on its uh, shoulders, uh, but having failed to uh, to meet the expectations of both the local and the international community, it has now uh, focused uh, its energies on repression, and we are in- seeing increasing cases of repression. And the uh, Patriot Bill actually legalizes uh, that kind, of, legalizes and crystallizes uh, that kind of um, uh, repression. And I, I think it's it's bad for the media. Uh, it dispels um, doom for many a career for people who think you know them are not put up within an environment like ours. <laughs> Now, it's uh, been almost two years after sisters working in film and television, Swift first introduced the concept of intimacy coordination to uh, South Africa in July 2019. Now, these guidelines have been created and compiled in consultation with a number of audiovisual industry organizations, namely the South African Screen uh, Federation, the Independent Producers uh, uh, Organization, and uh, sisters uh, working in film and television. These uh, South African industry organizations have been working collectively on the protocols for the last 15 months and hope that these will provide guidance to all in the industry as to how to keep cast and crew safe when working with intimate content. Well, for more on this, I'm now joined by actress and uh, 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 casting director uh, Kimberly Stark and also uh, intimacy coordinator Kate uh, Lush. Uh, ladies, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Welcome to the programme. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, let me start with you, Kate. Um, definition. What on earth is an intimacy coordinator? <laughs> okay. Um, I think the intimacy coordinator is a word. It's a two, the two words. Intimacy, so the intimate content, so any kind of intimate content that's going to be in a film, whether it or TV series or even theatre, whether it's emotional intimacy or physical intimacy, whether it's sexually charged or non-sexually charged. Um, so that's the intimacy. And then the coordination comes where my role specifically is I look holistically at what the actors agree to, what the director wants, what the storytelling wants, how production is going to handle it, how wardrobe's going to handle it. And we've got to pull all of these elements together, get an agreement of consent into place, understand what people's boundaries are. Then when we work together on set, then I start then physically looking and assisting with the choreography. So, so then while I'm looking at the choreography, I'm working, how do the bodies work together? How do you make sure the storytelling's met? What are the beats of the scene? What, what, what do we want the audience to get from this moment? And how do we keep the actors in the world of their character rather than going to any sense of personal crisis or shame while, while they're doing that? Meanwhile, I'm also looking at the whole crew seeing actually if it's if they're watching a scene of sexual violence all day and they're kind of faced in that intense you know environment that might actually be the cameraman that needs you know a second to go are you okay how are you do you need to take a second so we look at the whole of of that and then after the scene's been done i then look back to the actors and i re-give them a chance and opportunity to come back to themselves to let that all go to kind of really accept that that was work that's been done and now you are you and you're going to go home to your family and have an evening where you don't carry any of the kind of the emotional baggage or the guilt or the shame or anything like that, that anything that you experience during that moment is left at work and then you carry on your, your, your day and your life. And then a couple of days later, we check in, make sure things are still fine and then we move on to the next scenes. And sometimes we move on to scene to scene to scene during a day and day in, day out, day in, day out. But we kind of constantly keep that conversation going. Um, so that's kind of the whole arc. All right. So, I mean, it, a, a lot of what you're saying sounded like s- stuff that the director did and then other stuff, nobody actually ever bothered with it. So what triggered uh, the idea that actually, guys, we need to look at this and actually put a person in charge of this? 
it has quite a long background um, in terms of people who were both doing the work from a performance point of view, but also from a choreographic point of view, where they began to understand more and more structures were coming into place for stunt coordinators and fight sequences and fight directors, um, and how that these were given time and space to rehearse, how we know that a fight is not really a fight, it's a simulated fight. And stunt and fight directors began to see that there was an association or a similarity between the work they were doing in violence and then potentially if they got asked to do sexual violence or more of this kind of physical work. Um, and there was no choreography that had been planned before. Quite often the actors were told just to, you know, just kind of just get into it and see where it went and kind of leaving it very much in a kind of personal, so therefore their personal sexual experiences, their personal relationship experiences were then kind of coming into place. And there was no blocking um, and, and no kind of clear structure. And so the earliest intimacy coordinators often came from fight backgrounds. Um, Tonya Cena and uh, Alicia Rodis were from this background. Um, and they started going, actually, hold on a second. If you're dealing with this superbly emotionally charged material that's so intimate, we need to find a way to structure it where, where it is really clear. It's simulated. It needs to be the same way. It needs to be repeatable. It needs to be blockable. It needs to work on camera or work on stage. And they started developing the work. In the UK, around the same time, um, Eater um, O'Brien, who is the original coordinator in the UK, she was working on a piece where she wanted to take her actors to very challenging places with the material. And she wanted to find a safe structure uh, to work. Mm. And so she started developing it there. And once we find that structure, you're like, oh, hold on a second. This is really clear. These are the beats. This is the moment they look at each other. This is the moment you suddenly see that they're, you know, oh, they're going to, you know, fall in love yeah, and they're going to kiss yeah. each other. And, you know, and it's very structurally clear and therefore it can be repeatable. And then you can then look at the nuances. Oh, actually, hold on a second. Maybe I don't step back. Maybe I step forward. OK, right. well, let's try it. How does that look? You know, so, yeah. All right. Well, let's ask an actress who's uh, been at this game a long time and has worked uh, with uh, other actors uh, as a as a casting director. Kimberly, uh, take us back to the early days of your career and uh, <laughs> chat to us about what it was like for you on set. I mean, you know, the idea of an intimacy coordinator wasn't there. What used to happen when no. you had to do an intimacy scene? Well, I just wish that I had Kate um, <laughs> working with me back in those days. Back in the day when I used to have intimate scenes, you know, it's exactly like she said. They, you know, that the scene's going to happen. They say, okay, well, first you're going to, you know, kiss each other and fall onto the bed and then start pulling each other's clothes off, sort of thing. We never questioned it. It was what was expected. Um, often it was a full crew that was there. Um, only sometimes if it was really, really, really sexually charged, would they make it a skeleton crew? Um, but they really left it to the devices of the two artists. You know, the director seldom gave us um, blocking points, as Kate was talking about, which would have made life so much easier. Um, it was, it was, you know, it was what was expected. Yeah. So we didn't really challenge it. Um, we just sort of dealt with it. And it did come home with you because, you know, it would be like, oh my God, my husband's going to see the scene and it's going to be awkward. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, my husband's in the industry. So it's like, he knows what goes on, which mm -hmm. can be good, but it can also be bad. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And it's yeah. just like, it's very, very awkward. Um, a lot of times what they would do is they would shoot all the heavy sort of sex scenes up front at the beginning of the movie when the two artists didn't know each other in case they decided later on in the shoot that they didn't like each other. Right. So, I mean, you know, we really didn't have protection, but as I said, it was expected of us. So we didn't really question it, you know, and as a casting agent right now, and I've got an artist actually who's just had to shoot a, a scene. Um, I was so surprised at the way production rallied around her. They had a, a list of what she will and will not do, what she will and will not wear. I mean, we were stripped down, you know? Mm -hmm. We had our, our shoehorn protection and our sock protection, and that was it. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting to see um, the way the industry has now started moving forward makes me want to get back more into the industry um, because 
you know, men and women are protected because it's awkward for men as well. You know, I mean, you don't want your stuff flapping around, you know, and, and women are running around topless or pantyless. It's, yeah, it's a different, it's a different era. Yeah. And I mean, I was so happy for my artist because I mean, she's like, I'm not comfortable with this, that, and the other. And I was thinking, well, we never had a choice, you know? What do you mean you're not comfortable with it? You're an actor, that's what we do. Mm. Welcome to the yeah. 21st century, I suppose. It's, it's fabulous. Yeah. And, and, know, I, and, I, and I, suppose, I suppose, Kimberly, what, what also helps now with this new format is when certain scenes are looked at and explained, it does help you in your process as an actress to say, okay, this isn't just gratuitous. There is a purpose and a value for this. And that, I suppose, gets received differently as you, by you as an actor. Absolutely. I, I remember working on one particular movie, um, Wheels and Deals, and it was, the director was very good. It was a German director, and he was explaining to us very nicely why we were having the scene that we were having because the two characters fall very deeply in love and they're not supposed to fall in love. And it was very tender and it was it was well done. And that made such a difference to other scenes that I had shot in the past, like one where it was a rape scene, where I was so traumatized and bruised and ripped off nails. I mean, there was like, there, there was no stunt coordinator. It was just hair pulling and clothes pulling and it was just so violent. And then when I saw the movie many, many years later, they had edited 99.9% .9 of it out. I think it was maybe too much, but I still went away scarred. Yeah. Um, and so did the fellow actor. So it's, you know, if we understand it, if it's, if it's blocked, if it's, yeah, what a difference. I mean, yeah. that would be such a pleasure to work like that. I, yeah, well, yeah. I hear you. All <laughs> right, uh, we're going to start <laughs> wrapping things up, but uh, Kate, what happens now? Is this going to be a standard protocol for um, all film and television sets? Well, I mean, it's becoming increasingly so globally, um, but quite slowly. HBO, I think, is still the only um, producing station who absolutely demand it. Um, the lovely thing about the South African protocols, because they have been created with the whole industry, and we are talking like the whole industry, from the editors to the writers to the cast directors, the, you know, the actors, unions, everything, that actually it means each person in the value chain hopefully will have been exposed to the protocols. And not that they'll ever be mandated, but even whether you can use an intimacy coordinator or you can't, maybe you can't afford one or you, you, don't, you think you can handle it, they, these will provide a guideline for whoever it is in the value chain who go, who sees that that content is there or wants to write it and kind of goes, okay, look, how am I going to approach this? Let me look at that document. Oh, right. So I have to consider that. I have to think about that. Oh, look, there's a template nudity rider in there. Oh, there's a producer's checklist in there. Oh, there's how I do a seed and feedback report. So after the event, we can go, yep, this happened, this happened, the actor questioned this, we dealt with this in this way. Um, but also it says, look, if you're doing this kind of a scene, you really need to think about what your budgets are and you need to get yourself a coordinator in and you, so you can do that safely. Um, and that, you know, that's the way hopefully this document will work. Um, and because it does have really every person's voice in there, if we started with a kind of like a basic foundation for it, and then we were like, okay, let's talk to the editors. So how does this work for you? And what are your considerations been? Oh, right, we never thought of that. Okay, that's interesting. That's all got to go in. And it built that way, which is why it's really comprehensive. So, so hopefully it's just going to be a really useful tool that anybody, whether they're student directors, whether it's young actors coming through the system who are learning how what their boundaries are, what consent looks like, what they're entitled to say, yes, and no to and how to manage that right the way through to post-production there's that is that will you know be very very useful tool for the industry going forward so fingers crossed it's it's out there now it launched last week um and yeah people start to talk about it and think about what they need to do to keep everyone on their set safe actors crew everyone well it sounds great i yeah. wish we could talk longer but unfortunately we run out of time kate lush thank you so much indeed for joining us and uh, kimberly stark always great uh, talking to you uh, thank you so much for your contributions both of you thank you
Lovely. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thanks. Lovely to meet you, Kimberly. Okay. Bye-bye. Nice Bye-bye. to meet Bye-bye. you, Ken, on a park. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. Intimacy coordination and uh, a new uh, development uh, in the industry. Let's hope that it uh, does take off and that it uh, becomes a norm uh, to look after our actors uh, on set as well as crew as well. Now, on uh, April, are we taking a break? Are we... All right, okay, now on April the 1st uh, in Ghana, uh, the capital, uh, uh, Accra, four police officers in plain clothes arrested uh, David Tamakloe, who's uh, an editor in chief of the privately owned WhatsApp news website, and detained him for 24 hours at the city's national police headquarters. He seized his uh, phones and mobile hotspots. And then he released him on bail on April the 2nd, according to uh, Tamakloe. The police statement accused uh, Tamakloe of uh, attempting to commit extortion and publication of false news under Section 18, 151 uh, and 2008 of the 1960 Criminal Offences Act. Officers released uh, Tamakloe on a bond of 100,000 sedi. Now... Uh, two sureties uh, told him to uh, return to the police station on April the 6th, according to news reports. Uh, to the north of the continent, uh, on April the 14th, uh, police officers uh, forcibly entered Tunis Afrique Press, a TAP headquarters in Tunis, the capital of Tunisia, to break up a protest by journalists against the appointment of Kamel Ben Yunus, who's a journalist and government ally as the news agency's new director, according to reports, uh, and, and Olfa Hababu, Habuba, uh, who's the president of the independent trade union, uh, the National Syndicate of Tunisian Journalists, a branch in TAP. Now, TAP journalists began protesting uh, Ben Yunus's appointment on April the 6th, saying that he endangered the independence of the news agency. Police officers escorted Ben Yunus to the TAP director's office. Uh, Habuba said, uh, adding that while Ben Yunus was officially in place as the agency's director, uh, journalists' uh, protests continued as of today. Now, no journalists uh, were harmed or detained during the police action, according to Habuba. Okay, it's time now for us to go into our News in History archives. And today we take you back to the 13th of April, 1996. And that's when a senior ANC MP decided that he was going to resign. But it wasn't that long, uh, years later, when he came back into politics and he actually became the president. Let's go back to 1996, though. Constitutional Assembly Chairman Sir Ramaphosa is to leave Parliament. President Nelson Mandela announced this morning that Mr Ramaphosa was to resign as an MP to join big business. He's to take up a senior position in New Africa Investments Limited, part of a black empowerment consortium that's trying to buy Anglo-Americans holding in Jonic. Jonic has interests in Times Media Limited, whose publications include the Financial Mail and Business Day. Mr Ramaphosa will leave once the final constitution is adopted. Announcing Mr. Ramaphosa's resignation this morning, President Mandela said it follows through discussions between himself and other senior members of the ANC. Mr. Ramaphosa will take up a senior post in Dr. Tantato Motana's New Africa Investments Limited, also known as NAE. However, he will retain his position as ANC Secretary General. President Mandela said they'd allowed Mr. Ramaphosa to go because of the critical role he was likely to play in ensuring that the wide gap between white and black business was closed. We wanted the economy uh, to be improved, and it cannot be improved if uh, this uh, wide gap still exists. No other man is better qualified to achieve this objective than Cyril Ramaphosa. And that is why we are prepared uh, to release him. President Dr. Motana said Mr. Ramaphosa's new General job Comrade would be challenging, Sir especially Ramaphosa since it was in the new terrain of travel, the economy. Cyril Ramaphosa has shown in his role both as a union organizer in the Mine Workers Union, both in Parliament and as Secretary General of the ANC, that he's got those managerial skills that black business sorely needs. 
In his comment, Mr. Ramaphosa said there was an over-concentration of capable people in parliament and cabinet. He said they needed more black people at senior level to begin to transform the economy. He said he wanted to play a role in that. One should see it as a strategic deployment from, say, active politics into, into the economy, where we need to be playing a role in ensuring that the concept of black economic empowerment becomes the reality that we've always wanted it to be. Mr. Ramaphosa has been widely praised for his work as chairman of the Constitutional Assembly, which is now ending the difficult process of writing South Africa's final constitution. During the years of repression, he was a trade unionist and leader of the mass democratic movement. From Cape Town, for television news, I'm Lehana Tutete. Yeah, that seems like just the other day, doesn't it, for some of us with grey hair. He did go on to become a very successful businessman. And of course, we now know him as president. All right, so let's uh, go now and take a look at uh, what's happening in terms of our newspapers. We saw the front pages earlier on. Well, Joe Mflanger, editor of Behind the News Network, will take us through today's papers. Joe, always good to talk to you. How you doing, my brother? Uh, I'm good, Peter. Um, thank you very much. And um, also, it's good to be here. And good morning to our viewers. Fantastic. So, which paper did you pick up first? Uh, I picked up Sunday Times, yeah. uh, Samsung Options, and I picked up City Press, Ace is Going Nowhere, and uh, the Sunday World, Ramaphosa goes for broke. All right. Well, let's start with the Sunday Times then. Yeah. Um, it, again, it, it looks like um, the the factions, uh, the, the the contest is hotting up now. Uh, the ANC has internal. These internal conflicts, are, I don't think they are uh, they're internal anymore because it's now out there. Yeah. That um, this one in particular statement was made by uh, the national chair who believes that uh, ACE uh, is trying to take the party down with, with him. So, but for me, uh, I will be thinking to myself that why would he be given so much power as an individual that will take the party yeah. down? So to me, that uh, it's, a, it's a concern. Mm. That why are they believing that they can take down the party? Does he have that much power? I don't know. All right. And the city press, similar theme, isn't it? Uh, ANC faction fighting. Uh, yeah, the the city press, it's saying this is going nowhere, meaning that power that uh, they mentioned in the other paper that is trying to take down the power, it means now that Ace does have the muscle, since we can see some of his supporters are sure that he's not going anywhere. So we see the extension and the expansion of the, uh, the, the step-aside guidelines. As Bumalanga is confused to say, where do we start? Where do we start to implement uh, the guidelines? So, yes. All right, and then the final paper was the, uh, uh, what was it, Sunday World, I think? I don't know, which one did you choose? Sunday World, yeah. uh, Ramaphosa goes for broke. Yeah. Um, it's, it's still the same, <laughs> the same war yeah. between the, the, the general secretary, the president, and their supporters. So yeah. it looks like in, in the provinces, in these committees, uh, he who seemed to be supporting uh, the SG, they are now, uh, it is said that they are now being targeted. So it looks like it's really, really getting ugly. Right. Um, in the past week, the president and the SG were in the same province of Guadalupe Natal. The other one was in Tinkan the other one was in Durban. So you will also see the coverage, how it was covered as well. So you can see that the battle of the soul of the ANC is now getting real. All right, my brother, thanks very much indeed for that brief look at our newspapers. Thanks so much. Always good talk to, to talk to you. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. All right, cheers.
Right, that's uh, Elijah Mflanga, um, um, uh, editor of uh, Behind the News Network. And that's how we come to the end, Joe Mflanga rather, that's how we come to the end of uh, this week's edition of Media Monitor. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. And join us again at the same time next week. Take care, we'll see you then.